as soon as I do. And then look at the uh, podium mic. Did we find a way to turn that one off? Okay, um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes this morning about some new work we're doing, uh, revisiting stars that were studied uh, from the Kepler mission. There we go. From the Kepler mission, revisiting them with tests. And this is a work especially being done uh, at the UW with some grad students, especially uh, Lupita Tavar, Mendoza, uh, and then Spencer Wallace and others. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, the test mission here uh, featured in an official tweet uh, from Tom Barkley. The test mission revisited the Kepler footprint recently this year. Um, and so actually two of the test sectors, like sector 14 and 15, and I think 26 will come back around and overlap again. Uh, are giving us a really interesting baseline for revisiting the stars um, that were well studied by the Kepler mission. Uh, and so if you ignore everything else, and maybe you should from this talk, uh, it's just I want to advertise this idea that this overlap, this parameter space where we're studying stars with both of these missions, uh, is a unique opportunity. And so I would encourage everyone in this audience uh, to consider what we can do with this interesting baseline with these two missions. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I'm mostly just going to talk about this one star, which most of you, I think, have heard me babble about for the last decade, which is GA1243. It's a very active, rapidly rotating M4. It was the most active flare star in the original Kepler field. Um, we spent a long time studying it with Kepler and did lots of fun stuff with it. So here I've just stitched together the Kepler one-minute light curve with the test two-minute light curve for the same star, with, of course, lies in the middle. It doesn't actually overlap. It looks good. Um, and there's a lot of things you can take away from this. Um, first off, the Kepler signal noise is really good. This is a bright star for Kepler. The one minute sampling means the flares are very well defined. It's very high signal noise. And we have 11 months of data with Kepler. This is a tremendous, interesting, and uh, challenging data set to understand. In tests, it's a little more modest. It does not appear to be an incredibly active star in tests. The flares are a little less well resolved at two minutes. The signal noise is not great. And we only have roughly two months of data. So um, it's a little more challenging. There's also interesting features. So the star spot that we saw in Kepler is still there. That's good. Um, it's still in phase while I lied about stitching together. The phasing is correct. Um, it has not changed its rotation period in 10 years. Um, but the amplitude is a little smaller. You can see these modulations are a little smaller. And that's because TESS has here a slightly redder wavelength, a uh, band pass. Um, the star spot here is a phase map. I won't unpack this in five minutes. This is a phase map. If you know how to read this, it's great. If there's time, a decade of time, um, in rotation phase, and the primary spot is still exactly where we thought it would be, which is great. But more interesting to me is that flares uh, are still present. Even though they're a little more modest, and it seems like there's fewer of them per day, um, there are still tons of flares in this test two-minute light curve. Um, the amplitude is also lower again, for, again for the redder wavelength. Um, and the lower signal noise means there's a lot of little flares in here that we can't reliably pick out. So by eye, maybe you can go after this one, but we don't know what to do with things like this. Uh, so it's a little harder to pick out all these little flares that just popped out in Kepler very easily. So instead, we turn to a statistical distribution of the flares. Uh, here is the sort of figure of merit for flare work, the flare frequency distribution, where we have flare event energies on the x-axis and the cumulative number of flares from big to small on the y-axis. And what we expect to see from the sun is a power law. We expect to see that there's lots of little flares and a few big flares. Um, and indeed, that's what we see with Kepler and TESS. Uh, we see that in Kepler, it's very nicely defined, this beautiful power law over several orders of magnitude. We have error bars. Let's see if I put the error bar. Yeah, we have error bars here that are counting statistics, so they're not very many big ones. We don't know the rate of them here. And we have very big errors here because we're at the signal noise limit of the observatory. Um, so the errors are two-dimensional, which are a little difficult to deal with. TESS, we have worse counting statistics because we only have two months of data, and worse signal noise. Perfect. Um, but the point is, these two lines essentially completely overlap, which is great. Uh, and so my takeaway from this is, this <laughs> diagram is extremely boring, and that's interesting. That means that after 10 years of observing the star, the flare rate, or the cumulative distribution, or how do you want to quantify this, the specific number of flares per day at a given energy, has not changed. We don't think it should have changed. This is a very active, young, fully saturated m dwarf. Um, but this opens an opportunity. 10 years of observation that we can do this opens an opportunity. We can look for these changes in flare rate. Okay, the most active star didn't change. Maybe that's expected. The more modestly active stars may have changed. On the sun, here's the same kind of flare frequency distribution for the sun. Uh, we see almost an order of magnitude variation in the flare rate on the sun between active maximum and active minimum. And there are other metrics for this as well. And so this kind of activity cycle behavior is now available to us, I think, 
uh, on a decade time scale. And with TESS alone, if TESS lives up to our expectations of living for possibly decades and operating, we can uh, go after these flare rates seasonally or annually and look for a slow variation. So we can look for slow variations in this flare frequency distribution across activity cycles. And in fact, we even have one candidate that you can ask me about and we have a research note on it. And with that, I will say, Tess and Kepler continue to provide, I think, the best stellar data that we've had uh, in a generation. Uh, and, you know, and it does exoplanet stuff, which is fine too. <laughs>